What is sales? We all have the wrong concept of what sales is. What I found helpful to people to remember, sales as an acronym, service, ask, listen, empathize, and summarize. Notice in sales, the word sales is not in sales at all. It's not giving a big old presentation. It's not manipulative. It's none of those things. So let's begin at the beginning. Serve. What does it mean to serve someone? It's to temporarily put on hold your own needs and wants and be of service to others. And when we think about this, there's some element of self-sacrifice in here. If you think about people who have served, we think about the military, where you're literally going to put at risk your life for a bigger, more noble cause. And it, there's great pride in saying, I served with this unit, or thank you for your service. And what that means is you're going to spend the time to learn what it is that your clients want, where they failed before, what it means for them to succeed, what's at stake if they fail. These are very important things for you to think about before you even begin to take any action whatsoever. This will lead us to the next letter, which is A. A, and that's ask. The best way to sell is to ask really smart, calibrated questions to use Chris Voss's language and never split the difference. And I want to ask an open-ended question. In Kevin Daly, he writes about this in Socratic Selling. He calls it the Socratic Open, which is to ask a question that primes your prospect into thinking about what it is they want to achieve. One way is just to say, so what's on your mind? This is a Michael Bungay Stanier opener. When a prospect agrees to meet with you, they have something on their mind. Well, it means what's on my mind is I think you have a solution for a potential problem and I'm trying to find a fit. I'm just wondering if I have the right problem for you, if you have the right answer for me, and if I should spend this money with you. A different way of phrasing this, and this is what you all want to work on because you don't want to sound like a robot. You don't want to sound like a person who's reading a script or doing something that's very templatized. You could say something like, let me ask you this question. Why are we having this meeting? And then they'll tell you what's on their mind. There's other questions that you can ask. What is a big problem in your business that you haven't been able to solve that you'd like help with? Now, again, you think this is too open, but it's not because they've already agreed to the meeting. They've already self-selected what they think the problem is. When they give you a hint as to what the problem might be, resist the compulsion to immediately solve the problem. What you don't know yet is they've just presented what they think the problem is. And like that good doctor, we got to put our finger on the pulse a little bit and take their temperature and see see what's going on. Like your heart rates. Well, okay. I'm feeling a little heat here. I'm seeing some other symptoms. Before we get into the solution, let me just ask you a few more questions to make sure this is correct. And by doing this, you're walking them through their own thought process and they're going to arrive at a place. So instead of you convincing them, they're going to get clarity on what the problem is and what the potential solution might be. There's a lot more questions that we can ask once we start to understand the underpinnings of why we're asking these questions. I feel so honored that I've been able to have this conversation with you in different seasons of my life, particularly different seasons in my business, because in the beginning of my business, 100% I was green behind the ears. And this concept was very sexy to me, which led, you know, leads you down the rabbit hole of value-based pricing. And people come to the conclusion of like, well, I can charge more for my services, which is true. But I want to add a caveat here, your ability to achieve the A in sales, which is ask these questions that help the the client to think is 100% predicated on the first S, which is serving and putting your needs on hold. Because my reaction used to be, well, I do video. Surely the foregone conclusion is that the, the solution to the problem that you're presenting me is going to be video. That's not putting my needs on hold. One thing that I had to become very okay with was the solution that I help them come to or that we believe is best fit for what they're trying to do may not be my service. And I think in the early stages when hearing these concepts and teachings that you talk about, because you talk about sales in a very different way. It's very hard to wrap my head around like, well, they're on a sales call with me. They need what I have. But the more I ask them questions, like it seems like you need something else even before working with me. How can someone combat that feeling to not like force the sale if they're really good at asking these questions and they recognize I may not be the best suited solution for what you need right now. You have to ask yourself, what kind of person am I? What kind of company do I want to run? How long do I want to play this game? If you're committed to doing this only for three to six months, well, you're going to get as much as you can and you're going to run. It's going to be a smash and grab situation and you're going to rob your client that won't solve their problem and ultimately not serve them at all. And then they wonder why they don't have a business in seven, eight months. So your mindset determines your actions and your actions determine the relationships you're going to have. When we talk a lot about customer service, what we don't understand is what customer service really is. You're creating a memory for a person. That is customer service. This is why Nordstrom's is still in business today because they have one of the most generous return policies anywhere that they don't prioritize lower prices. They prioritize better customer service. This is why Zappos was sold to Amazon for a billion dollars when 
they sold a commodity with fairly low profit margins because they prioritize customer service. What is the memory that you're creating? When you can understand this, your relationships with the people that matter in your life, your friends and your family, with your parents, with your teachers, with your students, and especially your customers will change. It's a mindset thing, Mo. It's why we call it sales psychology. Oh, hey, you're still here. I'm glad. Because I want to tell you about our upcoming future Euro workshop tour that I'm going on yeah, starting in April in seven different cities. I'm super excited to get back and seeing people in real time. In many ways, this is the stuff that they should have taught you in school, but didn't. So it's like business school confidential made for creative people. So if this interests you, please, please check out the link in the description below. I hope to see you sometime soon. I'm putting myself in the shoes of a person who's just starting out, hungry, needing to make money. Some of this may feel conflicting. I was like, dude, I need to make some money. Everyone talks about like closed mouths don't get fed. You need to sell. I really feel like you are creating like a paradigm shift. The filter you need to ask yourself from my understanding of what you just said, even if you're early on, it's like, who do you want to be? What business do you want to run? As you grow, you may not be the one on the front line selling. The foundation, the values, the experience that you set is going to permeate throughout all of your sales reps, throughout your team, and then how they run the company while you, whether you be a visionary, or whatever that may look like, is going to translate to the end consumer. I just really, really love like, don't think in the short term. And that can be challenging. And I think the best way to find yourself looking really far ahead is asking that, which I think is a tough question. Who do you want to be like? That's like philosophical and big, but I think that's the first step in you really developing not just what kind of business you're in, but the values that your business honors. I'd love for you to, to move forward with the rest of the acronym, unless you feel like you've you've covered it well. No, no, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> Let me tell you a couple other things. Please. Okay? It sounds like it's a difficult decision to make, but it really isn't. What is the point of having ethics and morality if you don't ever act on them? I'm not asking you to change because some to be someone else. I'm asking you to think about who you are as it relates to who you want to be. How you act, if it's consistent with who you are, brings you joy. What sends you into the land of guilt and shame is when you act outside of who you think you are. This is a really critical thing. Jordan Peterson talks about this. He says every time you're asked to make a decision and you feel weak, it's a sign that you're going to do something that's against your core beliefs. So he says, find the courage to act in this moment of weakness. What kind of relationship do you want to have in the life cycle of your business? Now, you may be shocked to know this or to hear this. I work with someone today that I met when I was in my early 20s, when they were a tiny little eight person company and they're a 400 person company today. Wow. Still have a relationship, call each other on the phone because it began from a place of mutual respect, professionalism, understanding, and something that grew beyond just, this is a transaction and this is really important. Are you going to be a service to other people? Or are you going to be self-serving? If you can get number one right, all the other ones fall in line. If you screw up this idea of servitude and being of service to other people, the questions that you ask will be different. How you listen will be different. You won't empathize at all. You won't even think about summarizing because you don't even understand the other person's problem. So first is to nail down the serve mindset to be of service to people. Follow it up with asking open calibrated questions. Really spend the time to understand and there's more questions you're gonna need to ask. You don't just open and then walk away. The next letter is L and it's for listen. Active listening is very different than how we see people listen today. Most people just stay quiet long enough so that they can formulate what they wanna say next. And you've experienced this, you and I have experienced this when you're talking to someone and their eyes drift a little bit and you can see that they're not really here. They're not here in this moment. Physically they're here, but they're not present. They're thinking about lunch. They're thinking about a smart follow-up. They're thinking about saying something that's gonna impress you. Let me contrast that with the way that I do podcasts. I do some very light initial research about this person. Depending on who it is, I might have to do more research because I, I want to have some understanding of who they are. I ask them to introduce themselves and to tell a little story. And then so the conversation begins. And I might have a whole list of questions I want to ask them. Most of the times I never even look at them again because whatever they are about to tell me is a clue to me what is important to them. If you ever look at my notepad after a podcast interview, you'll see there are like eight pages written on both sides, words, rabbit holes, things that I circle, like things that I draw an arrow to to say follow up on this, or that's a good hook, underlining something. And what I'm doing in that moment is I'm trying to relive the emotion with them. This leads us to empathize. 
So yeah, you ask good questions, you listen, but if you're a robot and you don't feel this with them, there's going to be a sense of disconnect. In Socratic Cell, and Kevin Daly says this, in order for us to get to the future, we must go to the past first. Despite the name of the company and the podcast, we do need to revisit the past because what we're trying to do is we want to close a sale in the future. We want their money in the future and we rush to it. So when you empathize, it means like, tell me how you failed in the past and what did that do to your business? And what the client's doing is they're reliving the painful moment with you once again, and they feel it and you feel it. And you're getting valuable information. The last time the person promised this and didn't deliver. Last time when I called them, they were non-responsive. Last time they promised three solutions, they gave me one. It would behoove you to present to them a solution at some point that addresses all of these concerns. This becomes your marketing copy. So there's only one thing left to do. It's the last S in sales, and it's not to sell. The last S is to summarize. Here's what I heard you say. Does that sound right? Is there anything else? And once you get a complete understanding of the problem and the potential solution, you're going to close with a hypothetical question. And it works something like this. If you saw a proposal that did X, Y, and Z in X, Y time for Z price, would you be interested in moving forward? And at this point, if you've done your job, it should be a smooth, effortless, Yes. Not to get too gross, but it's like you had a lot of prune juice and it's just efforts. That's your movement. <laughs> movement, right? <laughs> at that point, you say, well, if I put a proposal in front of you at the close of business day, is there anything else that would give you pause in terms of moving forward? And we ask this question because people get into this thing called buyer's remorse because there's so much rapport building and they feel so guilty and to say no, and they're going to start to think about, is there any other reason why we wouldn't move forward? Is there a partner that needs to consider this? Are there payment options that they need to talk about? And then they'll bring this up to you. And it's a brilliant way for you to say, okay, I see. Before I go do the proposal, you need flexible payment terms. And there's still one nagging concern that somebody else is going to bring up and it's this. They'll still be concerned about X, Y, Chris. And that's when you say, okay, so what might be a solution to that? And you activate them to help you solve this. How might we solve that? And then they design the solution with you. And sometimes you can't deliver and that's okay. And it's good to know. If you can't deliver, you need to ask another question. Is this a deal killer? Is this not happening contingent on someone being able to say yes to this? And then if, they're, if they say yes, it's a deal killer, then you should say, and if you can't deliver, that's unfortunate. That's the one thing I can't give you. Most people hide behind a proposal. They're not willing to have this conversation up front. So they do a lot of work on the back end to prepare incredibly well-crafted proposals that the clients A, don't read, skip to the bottom line and say, this is not gonna work for me. To quote Blair Ends, the proposal isn't the document that you send. It's the words you say. The document is just a receipt for the words. Even if you don't close as often as you'd like, you've at least now saved yourself a lot of work and heartache. One of the most difficult things to do in most enterprises that provide highly bespoke custom services is the proposal writing process. If nothing else, I've saved you some time from doing unnecessary work for clients who are not ready to buy. And I think that's worth something.